thank you for coming. It's good to be with you. This morning I want to talk to you based on similar things I said last week. Last week, Saturday, I had prepared my message and said all my notes and everything. And about four in the morning, the Spirit of God woke me up and said, you have to change your message. I was going to teach on preparing for the harvest because I perceived that 2019 will be the year of the harvest. The year of multiplication and increase. And, and as much as it's a year of harvest, some will, some will experience it and others won't. And the difference between those who will and those who will not is preparation. Preparation. If you are not prepared, the opportunity will come and you will miss it. Um, one of the prime ministers of Great Britain, Winston Churchill, said in the 1940s that in life, there come a time in every man's life when destiny taps on one's shoulders and calls upon you to perform a duty for which you were born and for which you are given the ability or capacity to execute. What a tragedy when that time finds you unprepared. I say it again, Winston Churchill said, and I quote, there come a time in the life of everyone where destiny taps on your shoulders to fulfill a duty that you were born to carry out, of which within you lies the ability or the capacity to carry it out. What a tragedy when that day comes and finds you unprepared. So one of my responsibility and that of leadership is to prepare you for the coming harvest in 2019. At about four in the morning, the spirit of the Lord woke me up and said, you have to change your message. And I said, why? He said, these are evil days. You must sensitize the church. And when you go to church on Sunday, lead the people to pray deliverance from evil so last week Sunday for those of you who were here if you remember I told you I have changed my message I switched the message and taught on deliverance from evil and I showed you scriptures that evil is not something but that evil is someone and I also did emphasize that the target of evil is good and that evil is not satisfied till it destroys good are there any good people here today? Please wait. Give me a wave offering. Okay. May I please submit to you that you are a target of good, of evil, that you are targeted by evil. And evil is not satisfied until it destroys anything that represents good. And that's why in a family, you find so many children, and one particular one is always on that such an attack and when they are ill like it was with my case when I was a kid it was always life and death and others have it so easy but there's one particular one whose life becomes very complicated and there are many sitting in church paying tithe, doing good things don't covet other people's goods or wife or husbands or children Good people. And yet, you, they can't make sense out of their situation. And sometimes, people ask God, why me? God, if you are that good, and if you are a God of love, why do you allow bad things to happen to good people? I'm writing a book entitled, Don't Blame God. Tell somebody, don't blame God. When I lost three of my fingers, I wasn't born this way. Through this tragedy, whatever it was that happened to me, I became very angry with God. Very angry with God. And I didn't want to deal with God or anything about God because I was angry. Why did you allow this to happen to me? Years after, I understood 
that God didn't allow it. He didn't allow it. John 10.10. 10. It was an enemy. You remember that the sower went to sow. And then the Bible said that when men slept, the enemy came in and sowed tall, tears. And the servant said, Master, didn't you sow a good seed? What happened? And he said, an enemy has done this. Turn to somebody and tell them that the enemy is doing something around you. The enemy is doing something around you. An enemy has what? Done this. John 10, 10, the thief. The devil. For the thief cometh not, but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. I am come that they might have life. And that they might have it more abundant. That is the perfect will of God. God's original intent for you and I is that we should have life and have it more in abundance. Somebody say, I hear you. The devil's original intent for you and I is to kill, steal, and destroy. That is what he does. And he takes pleasure in killing and destroying good people. That is his agenda. And you can say because you are a good person, God is under obligation to protect you no matter what. It's not true. If you are a good person, you are the enemy's target. If you are at war with a country, you don't bother yourselves and deploy your troops to conquer a territory and a people you've already captured and conquered. You concentrate on the ones you haven't yet captured and conquered. Is that correct? So the enemy don't spend his energy and time on wicked people because he had them already. His time and his energy is on those of us, the good ones that he hasn't yet captured and conquered. You are his target. Tell somebody, do you know you are the target of evil? I need to tell you because there come a time when people ask questions. Why did God allow this? And why? Why me? And if God be good, why did he allow this? And there are people who believe that God is in control of all things. Yes. Yes. But it's not full truth. In the final analysis, it will all fall in line with his original plan. But in between, between now and the final analysis, a lot of things will happen which he's not, con he's not in control of. Because if he was in control of everything, then Adam and Eve wouldn't have ate the tree, the fruit of the tree. They wouldn't. God does not control the will of man. To control your will and my will is to violate the right of man. He made us a free being. We are not robots. And somebody said, well, if God knew that Adam and Eve would eat the fruit of the tree, and if Satan be evil, why did God create Lucifer anyway for him to come and trouble us? When you see Jesus, ask him. Don't ask me. I can't answer that. Because the Bible says his thoughts are not our thoughts. Neither are his ways our ways. As I grow, I have understand or I've come to a conclusion that I understand that I don't understand. The matters of faith, when it comes to the matters of faith, it's not about understanding, it's about belief. It's about faith. So I was very angry with God. Even though I was born again, I didn't know why what happened to me should happen. And sometimes it is said that good people die early and wicked people live long. It's simple. The wicked people are already taken. They've already been conquered by the enemy, so he doesn't care about them. 
He cares about the good ones who haven't been conquered. You are his target. Wicked people are not his target. They are already conquered. He already has them. Their destiny is already determined. It is you that he hasn't yet conquered that is interested in you. So he throws everything at you and gives others exemption. Leaves others alone and goes for you. Second Chronicles 18 and the 30th verse. I want us to deal with demonic concentration. Then I want us to pray. I want us to pray for families. For families. Go ahead. Now the king of Syria had commanded the captains of the chariots that were with him, saying, Fight ye not with small or great, save only with the king of Israel. You see, he said, don't fight anyone. This, this was a war going on between two nations. And the king of Syria called his captains and said, hey, come here. Let me tell you something. Don't waste your arrows, your time, your weapons, your energy on anyone. No matter how great or small they are, forget about them. Focus on the king of Israel. Fight only the king of Israel. Leave everyone else alone. Some of you in your family, among your siblings, you are the target of evil. So sometimes it's like, how come everybody gets it easy? Everything goes well with others. But when it comes to me, it's like everything is a fight. I've been there. Started from my mother's womb. Even in the Christian community, all over the world and in Ghana, the Bible said, David said, I'm for peace, but when I speak, they are for war. Your good intention, even when you stand for the cause of Christ, is misunderstood. Sometimes your challenges come from within the brethren, not without. Sometimes a lot of the battles we fight is not from outside, it's within. For a man's enemy shall be those of his own house. Sometimes your enemy won't be unbelievers. It will be brethren in the church. Right in the church. Where we are supposed to serve the Lord and find refuge and peace. That is where you find opposition. And what is the purpose of the opposition in the church? To drive you out of the church. So that whatever you are running away from, for which you came to God, it will drive you back into the hands of the enemy. The place we are supposed to find peace and refuge becomes the place of battle. The place of our promised land where milk and honey is supposed to flow becomes a battleground. When you come to church, we are supposed to find love, harmony, forgiveness, support, refuge, safety. It becomes a place of battle, hatred. Envy, jealousy, strife, and unforgiveness. And you say to yourself, you ask yourself, is this church? Is it what I'm running away from? To? The enemy is very good at what he does. The Bible calls him the old serpent. Tell somebody he's older than your grandfather. Very good at what he do, and he doesn't play fair. And I think I can never overemphasize what I'm trying to say, because if I don't tell you this truth, as you go on in life, and you face the realities of life, you might be discouraged, and you might even give up on serving God, and quit your faith, and lose your faith in God. That's why Jesus said to Peter, Satan have asked for you to destroy you, but I prayed for you that your faith will not fail. Why? Because Satan is looking for your faith in God. If he can get you to stop believing, if he can discredit the word of God, if he can discredit God and the scriptures, you are finished. You are finished. Because the just shall live by faith. And faith is the weapon that overcomes this world. And if you lose faith in God, you are finished. And so your faith is a target. If he can get you to lose your faith 
in God and in the scriptures, you have nothing to stand for. You are a sinking sun. You stop living when you lose faith in God. So his target is to throw everything at you. And that was what he did to Job. He went for everything he loved. His kids threw everything at him and his kids were still standing. And he said, I'm not through with you yet. I'm going to make you doubt God and curse God. By the time I'm through with you, you will not know what hit you. And Job said, though he slays me, yet I will trust him. Then, when everything failed, he said to the wife, you are the closest to him. You are the closest to him. I need you to betray him. I need you to turn on him. I need you to doubt and confuse him. I need you to tell him to curse God and die so you can be free. You are beautiful, attractive. You can marry again. Why do you have to go through all of this craziness? Tell him to curse God and let him lose his faith and die. And she said it and he looked at her in the eye and said, Girl, you speak like one of those silly women. I know my redeemer liveth. I know. He said, he said, I know. Not I feel. Sometimes you don't have to feel. You just got to know. I know my redeemer liveth. This morning... I want you to understand some few principles that God is not in control of everything. He's in control of lives, people, and nations submitted to him. And even what he's in control on, he said, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. I woke up early in the morning, went to the kitchen for tea, and the Spirit said to me, the Holy Ghost said to me to turn off... Um, on a transformer, heavy transformer, controlling the free, the free, the deep freezers and things. The night before, the electrician had come to do some work and he left the wires and everything exposed and he didn't tape and cover things and he left. Lots of carelessness here. So the Holy Spirit said, go and turn off the plug. And I was thinking in my mind, if I turn it off, everything in the fridge and the deep freezer will go bad. Anyway, I went and I turned it off. I went to the kitchen. When I came back, one of my little girl had woken up and crawled and went nowhere but to that room and sat on the transformer and was playing. And I was a very serious believer. Right now, I've, I've attached a lot of wisdom to my zeal. And when I called the electrician, he said, Papa, God loves you. And I said, why? He said, do you know what just happened? That transformer, he mentioned how many thousands of, I mean, it was heavy. And he said, it would have killed her immediately. And if you saw it and went for her, you also would have gone. That's how powerful it was. But it was an error from his side. Something he should have done that he left there. So I'll come and do it tomorrow morning. And that was an opening. I pray that every opening around you and any error that will give the enemy an advantage to kill, steal, and to destroy you or anything around you will be interrupted. Say interrupted in the name of Jesus. Sit down for two minutes. Ladies and gentlemen, we need the Holy Spirit than ever before. I understand why Jesus said, you will not preach. He said, don't preach. Tarry in Jerusalem. Till he comes because he will show you things to come. Say advanced knowledge. Without the Holy Ghost in all of our lives working. Because the Spirit is always speaking. That's why the Bible says quench him not and grieve him not. Because we quench him, we grieve him by not listening. By not paying attention. By being distracted. By giving attention to everything but him. We are busy about everything. We pay attention to everything but the Holy Spirit. And he's speaking every day, cautioning us, showing us through dreams and revelation, and giving us promptings in our spirit, and yet we ignore him. 
I've experienced a lot of deliverances by just ordinary promptings of the spirit where sometimes I feel a discomfort about something or about somebody and the person is impressive physically and everybody likes the person and everybody is speaking well of the person but inside of me there is this discomfort I can't explain it I haven't heard anything I haven't seen any revelation but I also know that in my spirit I feel a discomfort and a dis-ease Sometimes even about some travels and journeys, I have to cancel it. Even though I've committed myself to last minute, I have to pull out because I'm not getting clearance in the spirit. Something is off and I know that if I force myself, I'll be tempting God. These are days not to ignore the Holy Spirit anymore. They are dangerous days. They are dangerous days. The enemy is on the loose and he has targeted God's children and he's throwing everything at the children of God and we need not to be ignorant of the times and the seasons we live in. Ephesians chapter 6 verse 10 to the 13 verse, Ephesians chapter 6. Finally, finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Stop there. Put on the whole armor of God. And this is where the ignorance of Christians are. We live in a dispensation of grace. But it doesn't exempt us from the evil days and times we find ourselves in. We need to fulfill our righteousness. He said, put on the whole armor of God. For those of you who have lived outside, where well, you have to deal with winter. You need to dress for the winter. You know, winter coats a jacket, and so many things in winter to protect yourself. I remember the first time I went to London in 1980-81, and I took a train from Heathrow to Paddington Station. And it was so cold and the wind was so strong that it was like some body was chewing my ear and I started crying you were in there so you don't know what I'm talking about and when I got to the hotel I won't come out I got stuck in the room when they went going to eat I said bring me my food here this wind this weather is demonic. <laughs> but as years went by and I understood that there's a way you can dress and still walk in that same weather and be fine. Tell somebody, how dressed are you? Are you dressed for the season? Ask somebody, are you dressed for the season? You see, that is where the issue of Christianity and Christians are that things happen and people start blaming and they are angry with God like I was angry with God. I don't want to go to church. I don't want to read the Bible. God is a liar. All these things they are talking about is all lies. They are playing with that. Nobody is playing with you and God cannot lie. It's ignorance. It's your ignorance that destroys you. Your ignorance of the rules of engagement is what destroys you. When it is winter and you go wearing a summer dress around, the cold will kill you. An athlete from Nigeria went to Germany and he would jog during the winter, bare chest, well built, and he was told that, hey, you need to protect yourself. This weather is a bad weather, I can kill you. He said, no way, I'm well built. He did it a few times, he had pneumonia and he died. 
The weather is not the respecter of whether you are a Christian or a non-Christian. It will deal with you. He doesn't respect children of God and children of the devil. You just have to protect yourself. And we need, the Bible says, the whole armor of God that you might be able to what? That you might be able to what? Stand against the wiles of the devil. There are wiles of the enemy throwing at you and I to kill, to steal, and to destroy us. Especially if you're a child of God. This season that we are in, are you well dressed for this season? Are you dressed to be able to handle the wiles of the devil? Because you see, that's where the problem is. So before you blame God, you start crying, God, why me? I'm angry with you. I won't go to church. I will read the Bible. God is a liar. You have failed me. You have said, before you go into all those, your hallelujah. I said, hallelujah. Mm -hmm. For you do all those, your hallelujah stuff and blame God for everything. Ask yourself, am I dressed for the season? Are you dressed for the occasion? Because there are wiles of the enemy. Ephesians 6, 12. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood. Tell somebody there is an ongoing wrestling. An ongoing wrestling. Tell somebody you are wrestling with something. Tell somebody you are wrestling with disembodied spirits. Tell somebody you are wrestling with persons without bodies. Yeah. They are persons without bodies. They are real. But you can't see them. But they are real. So whether you know it or not, I'm just telling you the truth. You are fighting something. And say, I'm very young. The devil is not the respecter of age. Watch a, true, a movie, a true story the other day where an 18 years, I think about 17 years, who does everything right according to Bible, teaches in the children's Sunday school, living for God, refusing to have sex before marriage and everything, and had a cousin who was just fooling, sleeping around, smoking, marijuana, just living a crazy life. And she rather had an appendix attack, and when they went to surgery, they realized that it was more serious than that, so they have to remove her womb so she can't have kids at the age of 17. And her other sister who was fooling, sleeping, smoking marijuana and everything was okay. How do you explain that? So she says, I'm, I, I won't go to church. I'm angry with God. God is wicked. God is bad. Why did God allow this to happen to me? How do you explain that? If we don't equip you to understand the rules of engagement, going back to Father Adam, telling them at the first service that the difference between kids here and kids abroad or the West is the fact that if your father and your mother was blessed and wealthy, it gives you a good start in life. And when you graduate from school, no matter how good or bad grades you may have, you begin with a million dollars in your bank account with an apartment, two-bedroom apartment, furnished and paid for, with your dream car paid for, with about half a million dollars in your account. Comparing, compare that to another young man, a student, brilliant student, beginning life with nothing and has to find a job, work, make money to get an apartment, much more buy the apartment and pay for it. This one is working, no pressure. They don't even want, they don't work for salary. They don't care about their salary. They are just working for the experience. Because they already have money, they don't need salary. This one have to work for salary to pay his mortgage, pay for his car note, take care of his family, sell some grandmother or father sitting somewhere broke, praying and expecting them to do well to remember them. So if your parents were blessed, it gives you a good start. And you can't be blamed for that. And if your parents were broke and didn't have anything, it also has its own challenges it goes with, which has nothing to do with you. It just has to do with how you came here. 
the transport, the means of transport you came with. Whether you came by a plane, and in the plane, whether you came business class, first class, or economy, or you came by a car, or a donkey, or a horse, or a camel. Now, this is it. All have sinned and have come short of the glory of God. Who sinned? Adam. And we are affected for his sins. What was the sin? Apart from the fact that he refused to follow God's instructions and chose to do whatever he pleased to be independent of God. The sin of man is one, rebellion against God. Independence of God, I don't need God. I can handle it myself. I'm a man of my own, a woman of mine. I can do what I want to do. But don't forget that our consequence of everything you do. The consequence. So now, Adam ceded the dominion mandate and the right of ownership over the earth to Satan. And then by that, God was denied the right of ownership over the earth through Adam. By Adam, he denied God the right of, because God gave it to Adam. And Adam, being God's ambassador, gives God authorization. When he ceded it to Satan, Satan then becomes the God of this world. And there's nothing God can do about it. And the only way we override Satan is by us praying. That's why when it comes to financial matters, Titan is very important because tithe is not the money or the amount. It's the principle of acknowledgement of God's ownership over all things through you and I. That God, you gave it to me. I lost it. I'm giving it back to you. And it is when we give it back to him and acknowledge his rights of ownership, that gives him authorization to rebuke the devourer on our behalf. When we don't tithe first and we deny God of the rights of ownership by using the money any way we want to, and then after we tithe, we, we, when you don't honor him and give him the first place, he doesn't have the right of ownership because Satan has it through Adam. Second Corinthians 4.4. 4. Second Corinthians 4.4. 4. Watch something. In whom the God of this world have blinded the minds of them which believe not, mm -hmm. lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. You see, so that is that the God of this world. You see, small g. The God of this world, small g, that is Satan. Who ceded the world to Satan? Adam. So God is not in control of a lot of things going on. Because if God is, then he has a lot of explanation to do. Because a lot of the things going on does not correspond with who God is. That is not his character. That is not like God. There are some people, if you come and tell me that I saw so-and-so and so-and-so smoking or drinking, I will say, get out of my office. There are others too, if you tell me, I'll say, let's pray for them. I won't come and say, let's just pray for them. You must know what people are capable of and what they are not capable of. God is not capable of doing evil. And if you don't understand these rules of engagement, you blame God for every bad thing. And you sit there thinking that, well, God is going to take care of us. Yes, he will. But there are rules of engagement. You must dress for the season. You must dress for the occasion. Put on the whole armor of God. And later, we'll find out what the armor of God is. You must know what the armor of God is. From the helmet of salvation to the blessed plate of righteousness, the belt of truth. You have to know everything. You have to know what the armor is. Because if you don't know it, your ignorance can be a point of advantage for the enemy. Go to the 13th verse. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, uh -huh. that you may be able to withstand mm -hmm. in the evil day, mm -hmm. and having done all to stand. You see, there's an evil day. Your evil day is different from someone else's evil day, but there's an evil day. There's an evil day. There is an evil day. But whether you'll be able to stand or to withstand that means to successfully handle it and master it is determined by how dressed you are. And God is not going to come and wear the dress for you. So, an evil day 
simply means you need to dress. You can't change an evil day. You can't change it. You cannot change it. But you got to dress for it. Because it will, it will come. But you got to be dressed. So when it comes, you can handle it. Tell somebody, if you dress for the occasion, you can handle it. To withstand means to successfully handle it. You can. God has made provision. You can have soap in your bathroom. If you don't apply the soap on yourself and you don't apply the water, you will stink. God won't apply the water and the soap on you. So there are certain responsibilities that lies on you and I and God won't do it for us. And my job is to equip you. Is to equip you so that you know that God is a good God. But there are rules of engagement. And sometimes we have to face consequence of our actions and our errors. Somebody say, I hear you. These are evil days. And one of the things I want us to pray against is go back to Ephesians 6, 12. I want to show you something there. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, uh -huh. but against principalities, uh -huh. against powers, uh -huh. against the rulers of the darkness of this world, uh -huh. against spiritual wickedness in high places. That word, spiritual wickedness. I want us to deal with spiritual wickedness. All of those things that they have their jobs. If you read my book on binding the strong man, you will see the job descriptions of principalities, powers, rulers of darkness. Some of them are responsible for the church. They are responsible for the divisions, the confusion, the arrogance, the pride, the lack of unity among Christian leaders, churches, everything. Some of them handle political powers, eh? rulers. They deal with political powers to create division among politicians, political parties, uh, pettiness, creating disunity, confusion. They all have their job to do. If you read my book on uh, um, binding the strong man, you see. But that word, spiritual wickedness, we want to dwell on that. They are responsible for calamity, misfortune, disasters, so many bad things. They, they handle that. You have to be led by the Spirit of God. You can't take anything for granted anymore. Amen? And there's a scripture very, very strong on my heart. I want us to pray with Psalm 116 verse 8 and Psalm 56 verse 13. Psalm 116. For verse thou hast delivered my soul from death, my eyes from tears, and my feet from falling. I want us to pray for the deliverance of our souls and the souls of fathers and mothers and families, the souls of young men and women. That's why I asked Fern Foundation to join us. The deliverance of souls of men and women, boys and girls, children, grandchildren, home and abroad, from death, from untimely death. And our eyes from tears, and our feet from falling. A preacher friend of mine, a few years ago, the wife went to the bathroom to shower, and she slipped in the bathroom and fell. And that was it. We don't want one family rejoicing and others crying. Let God spare us tears. Let our feet be delivered from falling and our souls from premature death. Psalm 56 and the 13 verse. For thou hast delivered my soul from death. Again, again. Will not thou deliver my feet from falling? Again. That I may walk before God in the light of the living? Yes. My soul from delivered from death. Let our souls be delivered from death and our feet from falling. That we may walk before him in the light of the living and not the dead. Say amen. amen. Go to Nehemiah chapter 4 verse 14. Nehemiah 4 14. And I, looked. and I looked and rose up mm -hmm. and said unto the nobles and to the rulers and to the rest of the people, 
Be not ye afraid of them. Remember the Lord, which is great and terrible. And fight for your brethren. Fight for your brethren. Fight for your brethren. Number one. Number two. Your sons. Your sons. Three. Your daughters. Your daughters. Home and abroad. Go ahead. Your wives. Wives. And your houses. Your houses. Property. Investment. Works of your hands. In the name of Jesus, we put up a fight. In the name of the Lord Jesus. For in the name of the Lord, we shall set our banners. Are you hearing me, somebody? Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be delivered. We want to pray for the deliverance of our sons and our daughters, our wives, our husbands, the works of our hands, our properties and our investment. Go back to Psalm 116 verse 8, that God will deliver our souls, the souls of the families of this house and of the children of God, not only members of this church, but the the, the church of Christ, the body of Christ, the children of God, wherever they are, that the Lord will grant us divine escapes. Psalm 124, verse 7, he said, the snare is broken and our soul has escaped like the bed from the snare of the Father. Let every snare of death be broken. Let the snare of untimely death be broken. Let the snare of demonic predictions be broken. Let our sons and daughters be preserved. Let there be divine escapes within our dwellings, within our houses, within our going out and our coming in from untimely death, from any form of disaster. Somebody open your mouth, lift up prayer, pray for your father, pray for your mothers, children, wives, husbands, brethren. Pray for the children of God, pray for the body of Christ. Break the snare, command divine escapes, command divine escapes. Command our deliverance from tears. That God will deliver our eyes from tears. Our feet from falling. Our feet from falling. Yea, our feet from falling. Pray. Our soul. The deliverance of our soul from death. Psalm 116 verse 8. Put it on the screen as we break the snare. Let there be deliverance. Let our souls be delivered from death and our eyes from tears, and our feet from falling, somebody open your mouth. Somebody say something. Don't just stand there. You have to say something. This is not meditation. This is prayer. You must open your mouth. Remember the devil is not the respecter of anybody. He doesn't respect parents or children. He goes after anything good. Pray for the preservation of families. In the name of Jesus, lift up prayer. Hear me. When David, when David seen and the prophet came, he said, you have given an occasion to the enemies of God to gain advantage. Through the blood of Jesus, one who used the blood of the Lamb, through the blood. Say, through the blood of Jesus. Any occasion an advantage we've given to the enemy collectively and individually that has given the enemy the right an advantage to kill to steal to destroy to exert on us to carry out his agenda through the blood of Jesus let him be denied. Let that occasion and advantage he's using through the blood of Jesus be canceled and overturned. Pray that prayer right now by the blood of Jesus. Hallelujah. Lift up both of your hands. With both of your hands, lift up. Say, Heavenly Father, in the name of your Son Jesus, we submit our spirit, soul, and body. To the Lordship of Jesus Christ. We confess the Lordship of Jesus Christ. We proclaim the Lordship of Jesus Christ. We proclaim. We declare. Through the blood of Jesus. That Jesus Christ. Is Lord over this house. Is Lord over our families. Jesus is Lord over our family. Lord over our loved ones. Jesus we declare your Lordship. Over Ghana. And over all that are in authority, 
we proclaim your lordship over the airwaves, the high seas, our rivers, our land, our highways. We proclaim the lordship of Jesus Christ over every family in Ghana and this house and our children, our husbands, our wives, our sons, our daughters, home and abroad. We proclaim the lordship of Jesus Christ. Thank you, Lord.